spin in a heavenly dance, oh God, all that you are is so overwhelming. I hear the sound of your voice, all at once it's a gentle and thundering noise, oh God, all that you are is so overwhelming. I delight myself in you, captivated by your beauty. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. God, I run into your arms, unashamed because of mercy. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed. So overwhelming, I delight myself in you, in the glory of your presence. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. God, I run into your arms, unashamed because of mercy. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. I delight, I delight myself in you, in the glory of your presence. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. God, I run into your Shame because of mercy. I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed by you. I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed by you. Good morning. And Welcome to everyone. It's, it's good to see you this morning on this bright, beautiful, crisp spring morning that the God has made, and we rejoice in it. And if you're visiting with us this morning, we especially want to welcome you. I invite everyone to fill out a card, let us know of your attendance, and I, I may step out a little bit here, but if you're part of our family and you're receiving our bulletin, you know you can reply your attendance and so if you're watching online I'm going to invite you to do that as well because you're worshiping with us. We have had Scott Sager with us for several weeks. He's had a tremendous, a terrific series on John and we're going to continue that this morning. Uh, he's also had a wonderful series downstairs on Joshua but we're going to pick up in John chapter 9. That's the uh, chapter that contains the story about the man that was born blind and Jesus healed him. I don't know about you but I think amid all of our senses, the one that is most precious to us is the ability to see our vision. I think that physical light and sight, that concept is so fundamental to our earthly existence. And really, the concept of light and sight is fundamental to our spiritual life as well. I think it's significant that in the beginning of the Bible, the very first chapter, verse three, God created light. And I think it's also significant in this gospel that we're studying. The very first chapter, verse 5, it says, Jesus is the light of men. You know, we've been, and Scott, you may not know this, we have a lot of engineers here, but there's, um, but scientists have been struggling for centuries, little, literally centuries, to determine exactly what light is. And mankind has been struggling even longer about the nature of God. So I think it's significant that this miracle that we're going to look at involves restoring 
vision. And, and the man that's healed doesn't claim to know all the answers, but I think we can all say with him, I don't know much, but I know this, once I was blind and now I see. And speaking of seeing, again, it's good to see each one of y'all this morning. Let's worship. Amen. Thank you. And you're right, Walton, about the Christmas. In case y'all don't know it, it's a lot warmer in Gulf Shores, Alabama. A lot warmer. But let's stand together and praise in the warmth of God's mercy and grace this morning. How can we keep... There is an endless song that goes in my soul. I hear the music ring, and though the storms may come, I am holding on, and to the rock I cling. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say? How amazing is your love How can I keep from shouting your name I know I am loved by the King And it makes my heart want to sing I will lift my eyes in the dark singing your praise. How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart. How can I keep from singing your How amazing is your love, how can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart, I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart, I am loved by the King. And it makes my heart want to sing. Hear the holy roar of God resound. Hear the holy roar of God resound. Watch the waters part before us now. Watch the waters part before us now. Come and see what he has done for us. Tell the world of his great love. Our God is a God who saves. No final word, our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Let God arise, let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Our God is 
a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Let God arise. Let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Arise, let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Let God arise. Be seated as we pray. morning. Would you bow with me, please? Holy God, on a day like today, as the spring is upon us, uh, it's an easy day to be thankful, Lord. We're thankful for each and every day and for what you do for us, but at this time of year, Father, it just seems that Thanksgiving comes a little easier for us. God, as the world today celebrates uh, the triumphal entry of Jesus on Palm Sunday, we, we thank you, God, for the hope that we have through Jesus. We thank you for the blessings you've given us and for the love that you have shared with us throughout our lives. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for all the blessings you are providing us right now with Jody coming, with uh, Scott being here to, to lead us today. Father, you are blessing us in a great way, and we thank you for it. And we thank you, God, for the hope that we have through Jesus. Father, you are an overwhelming God. Uh, your, your power is incomprehensible to us, and we just uh, we humble ourselves in your presence, God. And now, in the presence of an awesome, mighty God, we pray for those who are hurting. We pray for, sick, for the sick here, Father. We pray for those who are struggling financially. We pray for marriages, God. We've got some struggling marriages, and... Uh, we pray for your mighty power to be upon those who are struggling and who are hurting and who are sick. Help us to glorify you and honor you as we go through this day. And, and may this service be a, be a service of praise and worship to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how, can we, how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Oh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Whoa. 
As they approached Jerusalem, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? Who is this? Who is this? When's the last time you've asked yourself that question? When's the last time you've marveled at what Jesus has done in your life? That you've stood or sat or lain in awe of what he's done for you, you and me? When's the last time you laid your coat down? When's the last time you laid down a palm branch? Who is this man? King of kings, Lord of lords, Messiah, Savior, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the Son of God. We commune together to remember who this is. And we remember that today, just a few short days from the event later this week, he would ride a donkey knowing that he was going to be crucified because he loves you. God, we marvel at who Jesus is. And as we consider, we once again sit in dismay and awe that you would die for us. We are unworthy, we are unholy, and we have no hope of salvation without you and through Jesus. This is his body that we share together. The bread that he gave to his disciples and to all who would follow him for the ages to come. And so we take it, we take it with hearts open to your calling and to your leading. May we never forget who he is. In his name we pray, amen.
Soon and very soon my King is coming, robed in righteousness and crowned with love. When I see him, I shall be made like him soon and very soon. Soon and very soon. I'll be going to the place he has prepared for me. There my sin erased, my shame forgotten, soon and very soon. I will be God, we take the blood that reminds us that we will with unveiled faces see you. In the same way that they saw Jesus enter the city, the perfect sacrifice, the sacrifice to end all sacrifice, we will be with you because of that sacrifice. It doesn't seem possible and it seems so far away, but we know, we know that in your time it's soon. And we long for your coming. When we, like the blind man, will see you. Bless us as we take this juice. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
soon and very soon. See the procession, the angels and the elders round the throne. At his feet I'll lay my crowns, my worship, soon and very soon. I will be God, we thank you so much for the blood of Jesus. We offer our thanks, we offer our praise, and we ask that you would continue to bless us as you always have. God, we're grateful for Scott Sager. We're grateful for the messages that he has brought for helping us through this interim period. We're grateful that you have laid upon him your word and that he is such a blessing to people who he's allowed to speak to. So we ask you to be with him as he again brings this message for us today in just a minute. Let's stand together, folks. In Jesus' name, amen. He came to live, live a perfect life. He came to be a conquering for our life. He came to die, so we'd be reconciled. He came to rise, to show his power and might. And that's why we praise him. That's why we sing. That's why we offer him our everything. That's why we bow down and worship this King, cause He gave His everything. Cause He gave His everything. He came to live, live again in us. He came to be our conquering King and friend. He came to heal and show the lost ones his love. He came to go, prepare a place for us. And that's why we praise him. That's why we sing. That's why we offer him our everything. That's why we bow down and worship this king. Cause he gave his everything. Cause he gave his everything. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. That's why we pray. That's why we sing, that's why we offer him our everything, that's why we bow down and worship this king, cause he gave his everything, he gave his everything, cause he gave his everything. Be seated. good to be with you today. Lincoln, the two guys that led while you were gone were really, really good. <laughs> and 
we missed you a ton. <laughs> and I'm so glad that you're back and you're rested. And uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's neat to be at this church because there's a lot of talent here. And it's fun to see how it's being used uh, to the glory of God. If you have a Bible, turn to John chapter 9. Uh, we'll be there uh, this morning. Really one of the key texts in the whole book of John. And so it's a delight to share it with you. I'm also excited to be with you again next Sunday for Easter. From what I understand, I'll be bringing my family with me. My wife is totally on board, and my kids are kind of trying to get used to the idea of traveling down, but hopefully I'll get to introduce my whole family to you uh, next Sunday. It should be a fun day next Sunday, too, with uh, um, everything that's taking place, and I heard there's going to be extra food around, and I love a church that loves food. That's just a, a really good thing. You know, in John 9 we're introduced to a story that really brings us to the Pool of Siloam. And I couldn't uh, go here today without telling you that back in the summer, I took 47 uh, to Israel. And it was a crazy time to go to Israel because Delta told us we had to go, but Hamas was lobbing bombs from Gaza at the airport. So uh, as we were flying in, there was somebody over in uh, Gaza with a rocket on their shoulder trying to knock down our plane as we uh, landed at the airport. Uh, we did, and we just had a delightful time for a couple of weeks. And one of the things that really impacted people was when we were in Jerusalem. There's a Kidron Valley, and there's a pool there. That There's a Gion Spring in the valley, and a guy named King Hezekiah. There was a siege of Jerusalem. And he dug a tunnel from inside the city down to the spring and then configured it so that the water would flow into the city and into the pool of Siloam. And so we all put on our swimsuits and we got flashlights and we went out to the Kidron Valley and you can enter through uh, Hezekiah's tunnel and you can make the walk. You kind of walk in like this with a flashlight. It's about three feet wide and about five feet high, and it's got water up to your knees, and you just kind of splash through with a flashlight. And about halfway through, there's a plaque on the wall that commemorates where the two groups uh, they're digging came together. They were engineers in Jerusalem too, by the way. And, uh, and uh, so we made our way through, and as you walk out, I mean, it's dark, you haven't seen light, and, 30 minutes, and you step out, and guess what you step out into? The pool of Siloam. And there you are in this beautiful pool, and you think, wow. And I want us to understand that story uh, as we look at John 9 today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless our time in your word. May it point us to Christ. May it captivate our hearts. May it call us to a holy obedience and to a realization that we have a message worth embracing, worth sharing, worth sacrificing for, because you are the light of the world. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. About the time Jesus was born, imagine that there was another child that was being born. And his mother took great care of herself. She ate the right food. She did all the right things. Father was in synagogue every day. They offered the right sacrifices. They worshipped the right way. They looked forward to their fourth firstborn child, and everybody said, the way you're carrying that baby, it's got to be a boy. And everyone was so excited. And finally the day came when it was time to give birth, and the midwife, the doula, was called. And in she came, and the family gathered outside, and they worked, and they worked, and they labored, and they strove, and finally out came this beautiful baby boy. And it was handed to the midwife, and she walked over, and she began to clean off the baby, and to you know, check all the limbs, and make sure everything was working the way it was supposed to, and she noticed that the eyes weren't focusing. So she got the towel out, and she cleaned them off, and there was something wrong. She took ointment and put it in the eyes. And she realized what had taken place. She said, go get the rabbi. And they sent for the rabbi of the city. And in he came and she said, this baby has been born blind. Oh. And they prayed. 
And then together they went in to talk to the family. You have a beautiful baby boy, but he's blind. Can you picture the dejection? Just the shock to the system of these two parents who realize their child will never see the Sea of Galilee in the morning. Never see the glory of the temple as the sun shines down upon it. Never see the Mount of Olives when it's just lit up with the blooms at this time of year. And they begin to think about their child who won't get to go to school, who will be an outcast in the synagogue. And they realize they're in this thing for the long haul. This boy will live with them for the rest of their life. And they begin to struggle with that and deal with it. And the boy grows up and they do everything they can for him, but the one thing he can do every day is beg. And so they put him in a good spot, and that's his job for the family every day, is to beg. And there was something cruel that was going on in Israel at that time, and to be quite frank, it still happens today. And that is, when we see bad things happening, we want to say bad things happen because they're bad people. And so we want to figure out somehow that there's a cause and effect that makes a baby be born blind. It must be bad parenting. It must be bad choices. And before you think we don't do the same thing today, how about this? Somebody got lung cancer. What's the first question you ask? Did they smoke? Somebody has liver cancer. What do you ask? Do they drink? Because we want to hope that there's somehow a cause and an effect relationship of everything. You know, that people who don't smoke don't get lung cancer. People don't have liver problems unless they drink too much. And the idea that bad things can happen to good people and that we live in a world of randomness where just things happen is not one we want to deal with. But here's the fact, folks. Life is hard. It doesn't make sense. Things happen that totally baffle us. And it's into this that God sent His Son Christ to try to help us to deal with the randomness and the chaos and to make sense of situations like this. And so one day Jesus is going along with His disciples and chapter 9 tells us they see this man begging. Now here's the good news. They noticed him. How many people pass by and try not to notice? How hard do you work not to notice the homeless guy with the cardboard sign when you pull up to the stoplight? How often do you try not to notice the person who's sitting by themselves in the cafeteria? Or the person who struggles with the tapping of the cane as they're walking down the hall. They noticed. And they asked the question, why, Jesus, was this man born blind? And I hope that we will be the people who notice. And I hope we'll ask the question. I hope we'll ask the question, why am I born rich and that person's born poor? Why has life been so easy for me when it's been so hard for them? Why does it seem like my family is so healthy when somebody else's family just seems to get more than their share? At least they're asking the question. And when they ask Jesus the question, who sinned, this man or his father, or his parents, that he was born blind, Jesus gives us an answer. And he says... Don't make it about the issue. Make it about the purpose. Can you think that with me? Don't make it about the issue. Make it about the purpose. Notice how he says it. Let's look with me in John chapter 9. They ask him this in verse 1. In verse 3 he says, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. This happened 
so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. You're wanting to think there's some kind of cause and effect, and you're wanting to think that this is just an issue, but what I'm trying to say is it's about purpose, and it's not about cause. It's about what God is doing in the midst of it. It's about God's concern. So that God can be glorified in it. Now, the temptation for you and me is to think that God is glorified in it when the blind man is healed. And here's what I want you to hear today. God is glorified when we live with the challenges and the difficulties that he has put us put upon us to bear. Not just in the healing, but in the living. Does that make sense? God is glorified when people honor him as they walk through cancer and their treatment. God is glorified when somebody who's going through a difficult marriage shows us how to honor God as they walk through it. You know, we only think, well, God's going to be glorified in the healing. And what I want us to understand is God is glorified when we live with purpose and try to honor him in the midst of what we're going through. Jesus is saying, God's being glorified through him right now. That's why he was born that way. With an unchangeable feature, God gave it to him so that he might be glorified through it. How many songs do we sing that a woman named Fanny J. Crosby wrote? A bunch. She was blind. Where would we be without Ludwig van Beethoven? Who was blind? Where would we be without Anne Frank? Who was blind? God was glorified as they lived with the challenge that God had given to them. And so Jesus says, this happened that God might be glorified and his work might be displayed in his life. And then he said, as long as it is night, uh, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who has sent us. Night is coming when no one will work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And so with that, to demonstrate that God is glorifying, that it's not about thinking about cause and effect. It's not about a person that's an issue. It's about somebody who's glorifying God with their life and needs to be honored as one that God's light is shining through. He bends down, spits on the ground. It's kind of gross. Makes a ball of mud. He gets up, walks over to that man and just takes his thumb like a painter. Just puts that mud right in his eyes. And then says, friend, go wash in the pool of Siloam. So the guy gets up and leaves. Somebody helps him. And he makes his way over to the pool. And he walks down. He's done it before. 33 steps. He had counted them. And he got down to the water and he bent. And he pulled some up and splashed it in his face. Began to rub his eyes. Hands. Water. And all of a sudden, a man who had never seen sees. And he's walking around like, wow. Isn't that, wow, wow. And when people see him, they're like, who is this guy who's so excited about, you know, a bird? Is he that guy? Is he that guy 
I'm that guy. No, you look like that guy. You're not that guy. I'm that guy. No, no, no. No one who's ever been born blind has been healed. You're not the guy. I'm the guy. If you're the guy, what happened? Well, there's this guy named Jesus. Couldn't tell you what he looks like. <laughs> but he spit, made mud, made a little ball, put it on my eyes, and sent me to the pool. And so I went to the pool, and I washed, and I can see. No. Yeah. No. Are you sure? I'm sure. That's what happened. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law heard about it. And this story becomes a comedy of errors from this point forward. Because he's called before the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, and they say, give glory to God, tell the truth. What really happened here? Well, this guy named Jesus, he made these mud balls. He put them on my eyes. I'm able to see. Oh, well, clearly, clearly, this guy, Jesus, he's not of God. He violated the Sabbath. He did this on the Sabbath. You can't do this on the Sabbath. What did he do to violate the Sabbath? He made mud balls. You can't make mud balls on the Sabbath day. What? Yeah, that's kneading. When you take water and mud and you, you violate the Sabbath day, there is no way. The guy says, he did this for me. No, mm -mm, we're not buying it. Call his parents. Bring his parents in. So in walk his parents and they say, okay, give glory to God, tell the truth. Is this your son? And how was he? Was he born blind? Yeah. How is he able to see? And they're like, mm. look, he's our son. He was born blind. But how he's able to see today? Ask him. He's of age. You're not kicking us out of the synagogue over this story. And so they turn back to him again. They call him back in and say, we've got to hear this story one more time. And this is where it gets great. This is where it gets great. He said, y'all don't know what to do with Jesus, do you? No one in the history of the world has ever healed a blind man. And now he has done this. They say he's a sinner. And in verse 25, the blind man answers, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But there's one thing I do know. I was blind, but now I see. How did he do this? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, but you don't listen. Why are you asking me again? Do you want to become his disciples too? And with that, they hurled insults at the blind man and pushed him out. And he bumps into Jesus a little bit later. In verse 35... Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I might believe in him. And Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. Lord, I believe. And he worshipped. Jesus said, I've come into the world so that the blind will see and those who see might realize their blindness. And the most religious people on the planet asked him, are you calling us blind? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin, but because you claim you can see, your guilt remains. I wish that I could take you to Rome this morning. If we could go to Rome this morning and I could take you down into the catacombs underneath the streets where the early Christians gathered to worship during the persecutions. 
They went down among the tombs and they found little spots where they could gather to worship. And they wrote on the walls because it was their place of worship. I would show you that this story is etched into the wall seven times because it was so important to the early church. Because it was the story that says the blind man is me. I am steeped in sin and there is no hope for me. And spiritually speaking, just like Paul on the road to Damascus, I'm blind. And it's only when God through His Spirit places His hands upon any of us are we allowed to see. And this became the story of the early church. It became their witness. You don't know what to do with Jesus. You don't know how to make sense of Him. I don't understand everything myself, but here's what I do know. This is who I was. And this is who I am. This is what my life was like. But this is what he's done for me. This is the way I used to see the world. And this is the way I see the world today. In the early church, there were three passages of scripture that were read before a baptism. Guess what? This text was one of the passages of scripture that was read. Is this your story? It was John Newton's story. In 1729, John Newton captained a slave boat. He took it to Africa and he filled it up with men and women who were captured and taken away from their families and thrust into a space about this size and put on a boat and asked to row and to wait as they made the three-week journey back to America. One night there was a violent storm. He knew it was going to swamp the boat. He knew it would be the end of them all. And the grisly old sailor hit his knees and asked God, to spare them through many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come, he later wrote. When they made it, he knew God had done something. And he walked away from the slave trading. And he wrote this song. And he wrote this song to speak about the amazing grace that's been poured out upon every one of us. If you know the history of this song, if you know the chants and the moans and the music that he heard rising up from the slaves below, what you'll realize about this song is it can be played only using the black keys on a piano. It's a song that can be played in all minors. It's a song that speaks of the yearning of our soul for the forgiveness of God and to be set free to see again. And if you know the rest of the story, at the end of his life, John Newton was blind. But he was writing his memoirs and he was the spiritual father of a man named William Wilberforce. Wilberforce, who gave over 40 years of his life to banish the slave trade in England. John Newton speaks for all of us, doesn't he? When he says, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Today we celebrate Palm Sunday just a few weeks after this story, Jesus makes his way to Jerusalem again. And riding in on the colt 
Everybody takes off their jacket. They throw the palm branches on the ground. And everyone is dancing and singing, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna. And in Luke, the Pharisees stop Jesus and stop the parade and say, Jesus, could you tell everybody to be quiet? Could you tell them to go home? Could you tell them not to make a ruckus? And Jesus looked at them and said, I tell you the truth. If they are quiet, the rocks and the stones will cry out. And so what I beg of you this Palm Sunday is don't be afraid to join the blind man and say, here's what I know to be true. I was blind, but now I see it's what the Lord has done for me. And if we can help you in any way this morning, if we can encourage you, if we can help you to see clearly again, that's why we're here. And we encourage you to come to the front as we stand and sing this song together. Let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Let the blind say I can see. It's what the Lord has done in me. Let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Let the blind say I can see. It's what the Lord has done in me. Hosanna, Hosanna. Christ has set me free. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. Hosanna, a tag right there. <laughs> good morning, amen? Man, it's been good to be here. Even if it is cold, it's good to be here. A lot of things going on too, so let me make you aware of those as we close. First of all, if you're a guest, our special thanks and appreciation for being with us, and we hope that your time has been well spent. And these things about things going on with the family. First of all, chorus folks, don't forget chorus practice today at 1 o'clock. And we will be meeting in here, so please be in here promptly at 1 uh, as we get ready for next week. Because next week is Easter Sunday, we'll be led in worship by our chorus. We, before that, will also have a brunch. No classes next week, brunch at 9 o'clock, followed by worship at 10, and then an Easter egg hunt after that. So make that special brunch item that you're well known for and bring it and join us at 9 o'clock next week. 
Upcoming is also Outback America. All parents and teens, husbands and wives, uh, the next Outback America weekend is coming up April 24th through 26th. It takes place just north of here, about an hour in the Paint Rock Valley. Beautiful, beautiful setting. Um, it's about building, restoring, and strengthening relationships, uh, especially designed to give parent, team, or husband, wife, couples a practical strategy for daily living, focusing on their relationship with God, family, and friends, church, and community. You can go to outbackamerica.org for more information. Scholarships are available, or you can also contact Todd or Lori Beth White for more information. Our annual ladies' tea is coming up Saturday, April the 18th from 2 to 4. Hostesses to decorate tables and gentlemen to aid as servers are still needed. For more information, purchase tickets to, or see Melissa Brown or call the church office. Our women's conference, the ladies from Twickenham are attending the For Such a Time as This conference in Birmingham with spe speaker Jen Hatmaker. Details about that are in the bulletin. Huntsville Inner City Learning Center fundraiser. And I did not bring, where's Shelby? I didn't bring one. I heard it was great though. Was it good? You had your own cake pop last week, and it was fantastic. Excellent. So you can recommend it. All right, then I'm going to recommend it. Just in time for Easter, you can order a cake pop basket. Each basket has six pops and is $15. Two baskets are $25. They'll be available for pickup on Saturday, April the 4th. And you can order them from Rebecca Tucker or in the lobbies if you would like to help Huntsville Inner City Learning Center with that fundraiser. Whew. Saving Way Donation Drive. There will be a truck in the north parking lot from April the 10th through April the 12th collecting clothing and household items for donation to the Saving Way thrift stores. So as you're cleaning out things, doing your spring cleaning, just load them up and bring them down here April the 10th through the 12th. And um, you can just throw it in that truck and it will be taken care of. Saving Way also has a fundraiser for, Henry, for the Saving Way coming up with Henry Cho. Uh, tickets are $20. It'll be at Grissom High School. I know that that's been a great event in the past. So uh, please, if you'd like to join and help out with that, it'll be a great night to do that. Starting point class, April 26th and May 3rd during class time. Uh, we will be having our starting point class for anyone interested in placing members. If you'd like to know more about Twickenham, what we do, who we are, why we do it, uh, it's a two-week class that will be very beneficial for you. Um, if you have any questions or need anything, call the church office to find out about that or see Steve Krieger. Jobs for Life Ministry will provide a workshop to interested parties on Monday evening, March 30th at 6.30 in the community room at Lincoln Academy. This is a great opportunity to learn more about the ministry and ways to get involved with jobs for life. Again, hope you're looking forward to next Sunday with the brunch, Scott being back with us, and the chorus. We appreciate everybody being here. We hope you have a great day. Let's stand and close in prayer. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for the day that you've given us that we can come together and worship you. We thank you that uh, Scott could come and teach us more on uh, how to not be blind and how to see the world clearly. We thank you for sending your son to die on the cross to save us from our sins. For without him, we'd have hope, no hope for eternal life. It's in Jesus' name, amen.